on Saturday at 4.11. Yes, we're taking a good look at what is fish room information. And today we got some interesting things ahead of us. We're going to talk about the water system. Changing water is always the plight or blight of the uh, fish keeping world. Nobody seems to like to do it, but on the other hand, um, we have to. So it's just part of the game. So welcome everyone who's been able to join us so far. We see Roman is in the house, Gary, and uh, you're there too. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this Saturday afternoon. We're looking at, as you might know, the checkered barbs. And boy, have they grown. And since the few weeks ago when we put the pears together in this tank, and th this is a tank that is now at the point where I'm looking at these fish and I'm saying, you know, it's time, it's time to move them to a little larger tank. There's just so many of them. And welcome, Stubbs Aquatics. So glad you could be with us today. And Jeff, also, welcome, welcome. We're just uh, revving up right now. There is a few green, green moss uh, tiger barbs or green tiger barbs, you might say, in here. And those tiger barbs are, looks like I did lose one. I saw one that didn't make it this week. And so, interestingly, um, it's the only one. None of the checker barbs have uh, passed. They all seem to be doing excellent. And, of course, uh, they're, they're just, they're not, they don't have their color yet. They will get more color later. Red Laser, welcome to our... Our live stream this Saturday and thank you very much for joining um, just to, as a reminder uh, these fish uh, we put together as two species in one tank and so um, I'm kind of glad that I did you see the benefits of doing something like this if the one pair which is the tiger barbs um, didn't do a good job and there was very little I would be having this tank with eight fish in it but the fact that I was able to put another pair and then I make use of the, uh, the tank space, you see. So here's what happened last week. You know, I put together the green tiger barbs, but not the green moss, the uh, green platinum. And in this particular tank, uh, I did get three or four, and there's nothing in here. At least it looks like it. I have seen only at one time maybe four tiny little fish. Let's see if I can even see one right now. I don't even see one. They hide very, very well. So I'm not sure. Uh, they are eating baby brine shrimp, and so I'm putting it in there, and they're coming out. But usually there's more in a tank that you can't see. So I know if I see four, there might be more than that, but not many more. Not like our checkered barb uh, phenomenon. However, what I'm going to do is, based on the size of these, um, there's one. I see one in the back. See, right against the wall there. I don't know if, see if I can zoom in a little bit. It's swimming right there along the glass. You see it moving, turning a little bit. You can see they look gold at this uh, stage of their life. The green platinums are like a leucistic form of the fish. So they are... Um, not albinos, they have dark eyes, they don't have the red eyes, but they have um, um, dark eyes, but yet they do take on the pigment lack, lack of pig pigment, uh, as you would see. In fact, oh, there is two of them there. There's another one. Wait a minute, is there three? One, or a reflection, that's a reflection. Okay, that's the problem with glass. Okay, so I see at least two. So there's two today, and we're taking a good look at them. He's coming up. Uh, get that bright light out of there. See if I can focus in. It's kind of hard. Let me zoom out. Ah, uh, that light is terrible. Well, there you go. Best I can get. Welcome, Andrew. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm thinking about keeping... I want to keep these uh, uh, leucistic tiger barbs, but I would like to use the tank. So what I'm going to do is... Um, Hi everyone, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take a smaller fish that are that size, maybe about the same size, probably from the ram section, and I'm going to introduce them and then use the tank. Because over here in the nursery, 
Uh, this is the section where I actually uh, have the nursery fish. They, this was that huge batch we saw last week of rams. And I've, ha I've experienced a tremendous die-off. And I don't know why. I've checked the water parameters. And they're just dying at a rapid rate. And so, but I still have a good sized batch. So while I have the batch, what I'm going to do is I am going to take these and I'm going to transition them. So what I'll do is I will, I have to transfer them from the big box, reader box, to the medium ones, this size. So from the big box to the smaller one, the reason is because I want to, I want to set it on the end side of a five and a half gallon. So they're going to have to just be dumped into a smaller breeder box with the same water and then I will just let them um, sit there for a few hours with the water churning, bubbling and it will create a same temperature and everything and then I'll dump them into the tank. So that's what I'm going to do with these tonight. Now this week successes. <laughs> we did have another batch, another humongous batch. As you can see here these are just doing awesome and um, maybe I'll find a five gallon for them too kind of early and see if they don't do better when they're transitioned from a five gallon or from the breeder box at an early age but these guys immediately took to the, the baby brine shrimp and uh, let's see what is okay this is interesting this is only one pair so this is my number six pair and the number six did an excellent job of putting out a lot of eggs this time because uh, this is not two batches, this is one. Amazing, amazing, unbelievable amount of fry. And very little dying, very little die off thus far. So I, I don't know why this particular batch in the middle they also died out completely. And they were small, they, they tend to do some funny things like they just hide in the corner and they look like they're being chased, they're fearful. But when they're like this, and when you see them swimming about in a group, they feel comfortable. Hello, Zebra Pleco fans. Zebra Pleco fans, appreciate your visit with us today. And we're going to be talking about some water changing techniques. So here um, you see uh, the uh, oh, uh, also a couple of upcoming. Also this week we have eggs. These are not free swimming yet. They're bundled in the back. Because this uh, breeder box is tilted slightly, it kind of keeps them all kind of together, which is what they do anyway. They'll they'll wiggle until they're together. That's what they do. And this one is now starting to swim, free swim just today. So again, uh, I don't know. It's a good batch. It's sort of a medium to smaller batch. I'll be curious to see how well they do um, by themselves in a smaller batch. That's pair C from uh, Tank C. Okay, so that gives you some idea of the uh, successes of the week and the things that have been going on this week in uh, Fish Easy Fish Room. So I would like to um, talk a moment if I can get set up here. Let's get, sorry about that. Maybe now everybody uh, isn't going to be so dizzy. <laughs> use my stand. I appreciate all the comments that have been made throughout the week on the videos and I really appreciate that a tremendous amount. A little dialogue and it gives me an opportunity to talk and to uh, express um, answers to various questions that may or may, may or may not make it to the live stream so that we can answer them even with others hearing so that you know there's a lot more people to benefit. Now I would like to say that there's going to be some changes in the room in that, first of all, they're just very minor. I'm just in, it's just in um, principle. These um, breeder, breeder um, tanks, the ones I call the workbench, uh, these are the ones that I'm going to keep that way, but I'm going to try to move the fish out into 10 gallons. And so the 10 gallons that are going to be used for them, they're going to be moved over to these 10 gallons on this side. So I had breeder fish in there before, so I've been kind of like combining them and putting them down. And, and one of the changes was uh, about corridors. We're going to talk about corridors a little bit because not only am I going to show you the corridors, one, one corridor species that I keep, but also I'm going to show or talk about um, a video on corridors. 
So uh, that's that's sort of what's going on right here. But um, before I move on, I think it's a crime not to show you the progress of these discus. These discus are really doing well, and they're just begging and begging and begging. I was worried about two of them. Right now they're at the front. They were kind of, oh, there's one. See the ones, the two of them that hang out under the heater? There's two in the heater. I was worried about those, and I'm not sure what's going on with them. The, uh, the... Hmm, let's see if I can, I can zoom out. I can't seem to zoom out. Why not? Okay. The problem with the heater, I don't know the ones with the heater, is uh, simply put, they they seem to be hiding in the corner. They they don't seem to be eating when the food gets thrown in. And uh, I haven't decided if you guys have a suggestion of which medication I might try with those two and see what happens. I don't know if I'll actually do them all, but I want to move those discus out of that tank, get them in a larger tank. So that's always been my my um, it's always my issue here is always trying to find uh, some grow out space for these fish that keep getting bigger and and the only interesting thing about those two discus that don't seem to be doing well is that they they do not seem to be losing weight I'm watching them closely after about five days now and and I don't see them um, thank you Roman I think I, I just I think I'm going to do that as a start. I'm going to put them in their own tank, separate them. Because I have this theory that being cichlids, being what they are, and I know how the rams are, and I know how other cichlids are, it could be that they are low on the totem pole and they're getting kind of pushed around. Could that be the reason? So and without enough space, being in such a small tank, I think it's, 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 they're going to just be pushed into the corner and that's not good. So I need the tank anyway for the, for the rams and others that are growing up and uh, other breeding projects. So I think it's, it's time to do something about that. Now, when I moved the fish out of the 10 gallons, I pulled out um, some quarries. And I will show you the quarries now, what I have. This, these are, let's see, hold on a second. Okay, sorry about that. I wanted to, wanted to clean the lens. I think my fingerprint was on it. That's why it was so lousy. It wasn't focusing right. But see here. These are gold laser quarries. And I only have about a good dozen in here now. Um, I had them in a bigger tank down below. And I thought it would be a little cooler tank. I thought it would be a little nicer for them. But I've had them for about two years now there's a few smaller ones in there that's from last year I raised um, a couple of them from last year but there there weren't so I wasn't so successful raising them in mass but these are a more difficult quarry and so I wasn't sure recently they've been I've been losing a lot of the adults so I thought it was time to get them out of the tank and see what's going on I actually I take the time when I, I have something going on in a tank and I'm not sure what it is, I often will just take out the fish, bleach it, reset it, and get it going again, but trying to kill off anything that might be an issue. But here they are. These are about a dozen or so. I haven't decided whether I'm going to keep them or if I'm going to find them a new home. Um, if I can, I think maybe if, they, if they're okay, I'm just going to keep them for a while, a little longer to make sure they're okay. I don't think they're going to breed for me this year I think the time is pretty much past I think the autumn and the in the winter is really when they go to town so I might move them um, that's that's my quarries and I was successful at rearing just a few of them and not a lot of them but a few I turn my attention to TM aquatics a lot of times to to get ideas on uh, quarry breeding. I know he says he's not a professional or an expert on quarry breeding, but but by comparison, since I have not had very much of any success with the quarries, uh, one day I will show you the other species I have. Um, 
down below. So I have two two kinds of quarries in the room. But I've and I've bred from both of them, but not to the degree that I think I should be getting. I, I should be getting eggs, and I I don't know what I'm not doing. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Maybe I'm not doing something right. So it takes a lot of tinkering. You gotta keep trying. You gotta try different things. Sometimes just an adjustment from one tank to another makes a big difference on a fish, and poof, you know they'll they'll spawn, and that is often the case. So I turn to um, um, maybe maybe Tim, I mean Tom will uh, be able to um, assist me. Who knows? Uh, down the road when I get some ideas of or questions going. So let's talk. Um, let's talk right now about the water change. Let's get into the subject. I don't think there's been any questions, some suggestions and stuff. Thank you very much, all of you contributing. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for the thumbs up, the subscribing. Uh, that always helps. Of course, um, I just do this to share information with everyone and, and to get ideas. But here's some simple ideas on water changes. A lot of people, I know uh, Malik was just released yesterday his video on the, the Python. Uh, I know that that there is water change systems where a hose is and can be used. And, and that may be the situation that you have. And you have buckets and maybe you have hoses. And that's what you have to do. And that's what you have to do if that's all you have. But what I've done is when I've set up a fish room, it is like the, the one of the most important things is to get a uh, floor drain. Uh, floor drain is super helpful. If you don't have a floor drain, floor drain, you can get around it. You can actually put in a, you can have a bucket, a large bucket or a barrel that actually can collect the water, the wastewater, and then it can be pumped out with a sump. I have a one horse pump actually, or is it a half horse or one horse in it. I'm not using it currently. Hey, Lay has joined us. Unbelievable. Uh, this could be the very first Aussie that has joined us. Thank you so much. I say that because joined us live because I know it's super early on a Sunday morning there. And that is just amazing that you're willing to get up this or, or be up this early. Maybe you're at work. I don't know. But thank you for joining us. That's marvelous. So here, here. You can use a sump pump, and my sump pump is very strong. I'm not using it at the moment. I have it in storage, but I'm keeping it because one day you, you might need something that big. But a sump pump, what it does is it has a couple of floats, and so the floats will be going up and down. And so when the water gets to the top, it clicks. This is already, if the water gets to the top, the float on the bottom is already up. The float at the top starts to raise. Alexa, stop. I must have said a word that sounded familiar. Hmm. Let's turn her off. So you got the float that starts to go up, and when it goes up, it kicks on the motor, and then the water starts dripping, but it doesn't actually stop the motor until it gets all the way to the bottom, and the bottom float then dips, and so they're all both dipping, and now the bottom float will stop the motor. So there's this... this amount of water that has to fill up before it starts and then it will gush out and a one horse motor or a half horse motor even is a tremendous amount. I use a one inch pipe to um, push it out and and it's very strong. It comes out gushing. So that's what I used. I used it a lot in California when I was there. So I didn't have a floor drain but I was actually pumping it out to the garden, the lawn. You can do that in California. Here it's uh, well, we're buried in snow still. Not quite like that in Australia, but um, hey, you know, we're all uh, having to deal with our situations. And, and but there's a there's a place for a sump pump, and the sump pumps can be very handy. But if you have a floor drain, it's even better. I'm going to show you my floor drain and why it's so important. The floor drain was put in for the room, and uh, let's see, it's right there. So it's in the, in the floor, but I have a, a uh, looks like a one inch, 
that comes out and then I divert it down to the floor drain. Now, it goes around the room. See how it goes back? It goes all along the room. So, wherever you look around the room, wherever I go, all these tanks, all these tanks, all the way around, including all the way when it passes by the open area, you see that big one inch pipe? That's my drain, that's my floor drain. It goes all the way around. Now, at each stage, at each tank where it passes by, there is a coupling, and the coupling uh, goes goes like a, a, it's like a straight coupling, but then there's a T, and it's a T at the top, and it's got a three quarter inch, so it's a one inch and then a three quarter inch riser. So wherever I want to dump water into the into the to the floor, I just have to find that that T where it rises up and tap into that. So I got a couple of I got one right down here I can show you. It's kind of e more easily visible. And uh, actually There's a shot down there. You see, this is the end of it. At the very end of your 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 um, one inch, it's like a loop all the way around the room. At the very end, I have a riser. This is the riser. Now this riser goes up, and then stops. So you say, well, what is that? It's open. Air. What does this do? If I pour water down here, it'll go down all the way around the room down to the floor drain. This is a riser necessary because when water, if you want water to flow, you need to have air behind it, right? It's going to have to displace the air. So you need it from the uh, air to, to suck in. So if I were to start draining a tank, in fact, uh, I'm going to show you how to simply drain a tank in a minute but uh, when the water starts flowing down there what we've got a situation is the um, uh, air needs to get in the other end and so you don't want water flushing out that end so you got to have a riser so that the gravity it'll never go uphill so so in this tank you see I have a, a pipe going into the into the tank and uh, it's full of water and it goes up over and down all the way down then it picks up all the way down all the way down there's that T down at the bottom that's where it goes now there's also a valve in the middle somewhere and that's that blue valve right there so as you can see all I do is I turn that tank and it will start to flow because it's full of water it's just gonna pull out it's gonna suction or siphon is the actual word it's gonna siphon all the water out of your tank so for me to drop the water line, it's just turning that valve, and then I watch it when I get it gets down to where I want to go. So these these guys, for example, can get a water change as easily as one, two, three. These are electric blues, and uh, as you can see inside, there's a strainer over the intake. See in the back corner, that's the three-quarter inch piping, and it just um, has a strainer. I for a smaller fish, I have to use a a um, a uh, what do you call it just the same material as you would a, a sponge I have to use some sponge intake over that it over that intake so that it doesn't take the small fry so I can watch the the level so if we're watching the level I'm gonna reach down and turn that blue law blue line well actually no I'm on my knees I'm gonna show you via another tank the same thing is occurring here see here's the sponge intake on this one this one happens to be gray gray piping but it's the same it's three quarter inch it just rises up it's full of water it's got a sponge on it because sometimes I put smaller fish it goes up and over and down below there's the blue there's the blue valve so here's the blue valve and what we're doing is we're just looking at okay the water level I'm gonna I'm gonna let's just go ahead and put this here so you can see it hopefully you'll be able to see it and I won't drop my phone 
I mean, this is a tablet, but yeah, I don't know how to do that without. Well, we just have to do it like this. Turn it around. There we go. It's much easier. Okay, so you can see both uh, the valve and the water level. See that? This is a perfect shot. So I'm going to just reach over here. I'm going to just, this is my water change. It's so easy. Watch. Valve. Turn. I've marked the tank to exactly where I want it to go. Now, why does it start flowing? Because it's full of water. That gray pipe right there is full of water. So when I open it up down here, the water starts, the gravity starts pushing it down. And then, of course, at the other end, it has to suck up water in order to replace the water that's falling down. So it's a siphon. And we all understand how a siphon works. But this is like a permanent siphon. I can watch exactly how much I, I want to do. Now this is a little different than an automatic water system. I call it a semi-automatic because, well, it's all, it's not like getting out my buckets and getting out my, my tubes. It's actually just turning a knob. So I turn it off. I've watched it drop down a couple of inches right to where I, I need to, to do it. And I've, I've, I've shown that here. You can see that up at the top here, the marks. See the marks with the uh, tank and the water level? I know exactly. This, this tank gets that water changed, that much water changed every day. The fish in this, it's like a magical tank in my opinion. These, these rams are gorgeous. And they, and they color up at a very young age. They start maturing and they're so healthy that it just blows my mind. This tank is a bear tank, and it gets that much water change every day, and pretty pretty heavy feeding, and that's all it takes. And it's amazing because now I got to refill the tank, right? Okay. So today we're going to talk about two ways to refill a tank. One is, and it depends. In this particular fish, you might have a 40 gallon up here, and I have a 90 gallon right here, and those are large tanks. They're large enough that you can change out the water like this much, 10%, without using any conditioner. I don't use conditioner. Maybe some people have chloramines, but I, from what I understand, I only have chlorine, which means that it kind of dissipates out of the water column with, as you can see here, bubbles and so forth, but yeah, I don't use conditioner. If, if I were to put it in a tank, and with no fish, and bubble it for a few hours, maybe even five to eight hours. I don't use conditioner, and I use it after that. But the water here in Canada is super cold. Super, super cold. I mean, it's so cold that actually the house water comes into the valve down below. It's, it comes down below this tank is actually the turnoff valve for the water in the whole house. But the pipe is copper, so when it comes into the, the copper hits, the cold water hits the copper pipe inside this room, it starts condensing and we have, I'm always, it's always dripping water, I have to keep wiping it up. I need to insulate it and keep it from feeling the, the, the warm air, the warm air, keep it from getting to that cold pipe. But the water's cold, so I use a mixing valve, and when the water comes out of the, um, uh, the wall, what I'm going to do is mix it with hot water. So hot water, cold water. Um, my water after it's mixed will be about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's 60, 67, 68. That's through the mixing valve. That's it's like a it lets X amount of hot water and Y amount of cold water in, so that the cold water isn't so cold. Because I think, um, I think it would really damage the fish if it was just pure cold water. It's just, it, it might change the temperature too fast. So now, how do I refill? I have three large tanks, a 25, I have a 40 and a 90 that are plumbed with tap water. That means for me to refill this tank, that much water, I'm going to refill it with tap water. No conditioner, and I'm just going to do it because it's a set amount. If I did more than 50%, or I did more than this amount, actually, if I did more than 20% water change, I would throw in conditioner. Because the reason why is if I take a glass of water, and I take a glass of water and you say, oh, it has chlorine in it. It has chlorine. Or I could take a barrel of water. 
and I can compare the amount of chlorine in both a barrel of water and a glass of water. Which one has more chlorine in it? Does anybody want to answer that? I'm anxious to hear what, what somebody has to say. A barrel of water out of the tap or a glass of water out of the tap. Which one has more chlorine? <laughs> Roman's right. <laughs> I know we have so many sharp people out there. Basically, the, the concentration of the chlorine is the same. So let, let's think in terms of, let's just say, put out a number. What if it were 100 molecules in a glass of water? The barrel has 10,000 glasses of water. So if I have, 100, did I say 100, 100 molecules, 10,000 times 100 is going to be a lot of molecules. So yes, the concentration is less, I mean, is less when I add less water. Why? Because you see, this much water has no chlorine in it. I add this much with chlorine. Immediately, I'm watering it down. So the same principle as taking a glass of this much water and throwing this much whiskey in it versus a glass of all whiskey, right? it gets watered down. So there's less concentration of chlorine when I just add a little bit. And so for automatic watering systems, you can run it for 10 minutes, give all the fish tanks some fresh water, even with chlorine, and there might be a few molecules running around. But remember, how does chlorine kill fish? Chlorine kills fish by attacking the gills. It latches on to their ability at the gills to be able to get oxygen. So basically it suffocates fish. So that's how chlorine kills fish. So if you only have one molecule, two molecules, fish, fish don't suffer and eventually those molecules will dissipate and eventually make their way to the surface of the water where the splashing will get them to leave the water and go into the, um, the air. Basically, they will dissipate. This, this is why we aerate tanks, because the, the chlorine at the surface, when it's agitated, will transfer out of the water faster. So that's the answer. So I have this plumb straight to um, my tempered water. I call it tempered because it's not hot, it's not cold, it's a mixing valve, so it's going to be tempered. Right? So let's take a look at the um, incoming water. Incoming water here is the blue valve. It's coming in. Let me turn it on. Uh, first, before I turn it on, I know there's three tanks. So I gotta make sure I know which tank it's gonna fill. So this one is being filled by that valve. So we'll open up that valve. So the blue valve there gets. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, so that's open. The 90 tank is the red valve there, it's closed. And this other 25 gallon needs to be closed. I'm gonna turn that one. Okay, done. It's closed, see it back in there? That's the blue valve. So there's always a three check process. Three valves are checked before I turn anything on. And I just start water. So I flowing water right out of the tap. And let's take a look at it. Sure enough, it's pouring in. The fish are like, yay, I love fresh water. Yay, I like the bubbles. And there it is coming in. And it's cold. It's like 67 degrees compared to the, um, the tank water, which is probably closer to 80 degrees, maybe 82. In fact, let's just take a look. I'm going to um, uh, maybe just give it a try. Oh, it is. It's closer to 83. Okay, 83. Um, we can check it after the water fills that, those many gallons. I would say that's about 
it looks like a less than a fourth of the tank so it could be just 10 gallons worth I'm changing so one fourth of this tank but look at the fish they're really doing well these are awesome they, 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 these ones have got a lot of color they've just started getting them in really really well they're going to be sold soon there's one without a black spot look at that I've not been breeding the breeding from those I don't want fish without black spots so I keep the type but every once in a while you get unusual fish, uh, those are the ones you can pick out at the fish store and say, hey, that, that one's different, you know, mutations or whatever. But uh, these fish are, these fish are kind of fun. They're always, uh, I think that they're, they think that there's food too. They go rising to the top. They, they love to, they love to go up there. Okay, so that gives us an idea. Now, I'm just standing here, and I have to stand here because you don't want to leave, you don't want to leave the room, and you, you have to attend to this issue. In an automatic watering system, the, it's an advantage that it's going to overflow. It's going to overflow in the tank, and as water is poured in, water overflows, and then the overflow goes down the drain or into a sump or whatever, but uh, the idea is whenever you pour water in, in that kind of a tank, you're never going to overfill it. This one can be overfilled, and so I, I've done it before. If I, so it's the law here, I'm not allowed to, to leave or be distracted and until this is done. So let's see where's our line. I just keep my eye over here. Can't see it from the fan. There it is right there. It's getting up to the upper line. It takes, according to those numbers, tells me how many minutes it takes to refill. So we were looking at a like, it's like a four minute refill. So I would do this once a day, four minutes, and I'll drain the next tank while I'm in filling another tank. So I do two things at once. But Greg Sage has taught me well. He said, basically, we're capable of keeping track and doing well with two items, two things going at one time. But don't try three. <laughs> You'll have a, accidents and disaster. Okay, it's at the top. I'm going to now turn it off. It's now off, and I just did a water change. Simple as that. That's the uh, semi-automatic means. I just changed 40-gallon tank water. I didn't have to get out any hoses. I didn't have to get any buckets. All I did was drain and refill. But I used manual valves to do it. I like that method because I also have to be in attention to the fish. I'm here watching them, I'm looking at them, I'm checking their health, I'm seeing what's going on. An automatic water system has the tendency actually to cause people to get a little lazy. They don't even have to be there. And they don't even notice sometimes when something gets clogged. And they're not, they're giving attention to the fish because, hey, you know, they're getting their water changed. But other things can be there. And so I, I personally prefer the method, although I'm not opposed to an automatic over, oh, automatic water changer, but it, it, it's how it's how rigid you're going to be willing to pay attention to what's going on. So that's one method. But what about all these little tanks over on this side? I'm going to go over here to this tank. These these don't have water from the tap. And sometimes in smaller tanks, I like to do a bigger water change, which means I'm not going to be able to just, let me see if I can stand here. Uh, if I want to change the water in this tank, I'm going to go down to at least a third of the tank, maybe even a half, half water change. So if I have, a, I do have a valve in the back, I have the same discharge the way of the way of just turning a knob and flowing out I've shown in the past at the workbench that their way of going out getting the water out is not with those siphon valves it's with an a uh, overflow it uses the tube overflow device and I have a whole video on that I didn't put it in the comments below but um, there is a video in my website and it talks about how to make these and that's for that's 
a discussion about trickle water changes. So when you're trickling, that means very slowly. But I'm doing it a little more rapidly because I'm going to go fast. So watch this. I'm going to turn the first one. And I'm going to see it, it drop. I just turn the valve and it begins to drop. Now, when it gets down, I can turn the next one on while I'm standing here watching it drop. And then the question is, uh, what do I do? Well, I'm going to take uh, something to clean the glass and maybe do a little maintenance and, you know, do something to the tank a little bit. But it's about one third already. This might be enough. So turn it off, start the next one, and just go down the line. I can just be going choo 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 choo. But there's no refill on these. The reason is because I want to condition the water and I want the, the water to be of the right temperature. So, how do I do that? Here's how I do it. This tank is 25 gallons and it's empty. This tank has a heater on the bottom. You see the heater, it's like a 300 watt heater in a 25 gallon tank and it's heavily aerated. It also we saw a minute ago that blue, you see the blue uh, sealant, that is the water pressure, water pressure line. That's my, my water from the tap. So I refill this with tap water. And then I let it aerate for eight hours and I let the heater heat the water. On the other end of the tank, you see a motor, a pump that's on the connection to that pipe so that pump is going to actually pump water out of this tank and it goes up through a universal joint which I've never had to actually remove and then comes down and then there's the off 